Have you ever found yourself questioning reality? In an age of AI and deepfakes, how can you be sure that what you see is what you get? It's not a new concept, nor is it a new term in recent years. But what do you really know about deepfakes? What constitutes a deepfake? What it means to live in an age of deepfakes? And what all the noise around it is about? Let's start by first defining what a deepfake actually is. Deepfakes are digitally altered content, typically video or audio recordings, created using AI to modify the appearance, behaviour and speech of individuals, portraying them as doing or saying things they never actually did. The term deepfake combines deep from AI's deep learning technology and fake, referring to the content which is, well, not actually real. Now that we know what we're dealing with, let's dive into the deep end with some help from our panel of experts. And joining us for today's discussion are Dr. Hanita, Mr. Kevin, and Mr. Corey. Dr. Hanita Asudani is a clinical psychologist at Alliance Counseling, where she works with clients who've experienced trauma, depression, and anxiety and she shares her knowledge as an adjunct assistant professor at the National University of Singapore. Mr. Kevin Tsang is the founder of Idle Life, an AI generative content creation platform that offers AI digital celebrity and human solutions. Mr. Corey Wong is a director at Invictus Law Corporation. He specializes in criminal defense work and has seen an increase in tech-related crime, computer misuse, scams involving the use of social media platforms, as well as impersonations. And of course, it wouldn't be a complete discussion without hearing what you have to say on the matter. Every thought counts, so let's check it out. I don't think we've seen the true like, positive use, use cases of deepfakes yet. I mean, if you use it with the cor correct like, caveats and create it with the consent of the person that's actually featured, then I think it's not so bad. These kind of avatars could be a good thing to be a bit more communicative. And that's the word on the street. What are your immediate thoughts um, hearing these responses? Have any of them resonated with you? I think consent is a big part of our laws, okay, and especially in Singapore's Personal Data Protection Act, the PDPA, consent is literally throughout the entire piece of legislation. And I think with deepfake technology or AI technology, right, the importance is consent. Is do you have consent to use my likeness for whatever reason? So if you don't have consent, it can be viewed quite negatively, intrusive even. So yeah, the consent um, element really resonated with me. So while it is viewed negatively, can the technology that leverages AI to generate these videos and photos be also used for good? Well, it is called deepfakes, so I think it has a pretty negative connotation to it. One of it is in the treatment of people with trauma, mm. right? A part of the treatment is exposure therapy, where you are exposed in a graded way to, let's say, something that you fear. Maybe um, if you've been through, let's say, an assault. Part of your recovery is to kind of face your fears. You know Stephen Hawking? Yeah. Right? So he had um, you know he had speech issues due to his ALS and then he started using this computer to kind of communicate with people. And that got me thinking, right? If we had an avatar technology right now, people with speech problems or communication difficulties can use the avatar of their likeness to communicate and interact with society. Corey, what do you think? Well I heard uh, Dr. Hanita she was talking about trauma victims when they go through that process of recovery whereby we are talking about maybe sexual assault victims because when they have to report the crime questions have to be asked and these are potentially very sensitive, very difficult questions and imagine now you have a child victim of a sexual assault maybe the perpetrator was an adult and now you have the investigating officer in the police force, being an adult also, asking these very difficult questions. The child victim, they might withdraw. They will not uh, be as forthcoming. Maybe as compared to if, let's say, now you use this technology, the person asking the question, maybe over a video platform, it's now their favourite cartoon character. Then the questions can be better answered by the child victim. And maybe we have uh, cases like this that can be better prosecuted and maybe have a higher chance of reaching success in 
restoring justice. While you were speaking, I was thinking about this because that also formed then part of your memories of your story over life. And the thing is, right, what if that part of your memory isn't real? So if the person is coming in and let's say it's an avatar of their family member asking them, you know, uh, what happened, they might, a child might have this in their memory that, you know, in the past I had a crime committed on me, I, the police didn't talk to me at all. It was never reported to the police. But yet I had a conversation with, you know, Mr. Mr. Wiggles. So I wonder about that, that blurring the lines between what's real and what's not, whether that also could have a psychological impact. Mm. on especially young and vulnerable people. Kevin, you were saying that in the entertainment industry, this technology can save companies a lot of time and money. How else can this technology be used in the entertainment industry? So we were just to put the avatar on the software, and then we type the words behind it, and the content will generate come out. So that's a cost saving on the production side. Uh, for the education uh, side, which is very, very interesting things we can explore. Uh, for example, recently we discussed about uh, some clients, and uh, they, he has a famous tutor, and uh, he have about 50 students all the class for all the time. And uh, then what the idea we have is, they will bring him over, we clone them, he has avatar. So instead of teach 50 students only in the one class, he can teach it 1,000 students at the same time to many other people. So that's just a part of it, how to actually fully utilize his technology expertise to benefit a lot of people. And as far as like, you know, being an average, because you know, you are behind the scenes, right? So for us, when we go and watch movies, what are some of these techniques that you're seeing, you know, proliferate our movie going experience? Are there certain things that affect you as an audience member? I think for me, let's say when I go to the movies, okay, and this is a, uh, I mean, I, let's say I know it's a CGI film, okay, computer generated image. Let's say it's the Avengers, all right? I know that these characters don't exist, they don't look like that. So I know that it's clear, it's CGI. But I clearly know that I'm signing up to watch a fiction film. I also see some uh, good coming out of this technology because I remember uh, watching Harrison Ford in the Indiana Jones movie, he doesn't look his age, really. So maybe that is some benefit, the ageing. I think that actually could help many celebrities to feel like, hey, you know, I might not be past my prime, mm -hmm. at least on film. But as an audience member, do you ever feel like this can enrich the experience or it can really take away? Like for example, the ageing technology is fantastic, right? Or even Sometimes they, they just bring back an actor who has already passed away. Um, recently in Alien Romulus, there was the actor who has passed away. You know, you really expand the possibilities for storytelling. How do you feel about this? What this reminds me of is, I mean, I'm a Harry Potter buff, so uh, what it reminds me of is when the headmasters pass away and all their, their information is downloaded into this portrait and then they speak from that portrait. Ah. Right? I think this is how I see uh, the AI technology to be like. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's super cool that you can meet um, people that we will never meet in our lifetime, right? People from the past. Um, so I think it's pretty cool, yeah. So we've talked about the positive use cases in the entertainment industry in terms of filmmaking, therapy, even the prosecution process. How do you guys think that this technology will affect the way businesses run in the future. When it comes to the AI uh, technology to the business, it's a lot of benefit. So let's give you an example. So in the, in the normal days, if you engage a therapy to do one hour live streaming, which is a powerful advertising solution to uh, many organizations. So, so they will pay about average four or 5,000 per celebrity for one hour live streaming. So if you go to get an AI avatar, how much they will pay? You pay four or 5,000 throughout the whole month. Yeah, you just need to use it right, that's all about it. We think about certain industries that thrive, maybe from the use of deep faking. Mm. So we have heard, uh, I think, cases whereby the Taylor Swift, all right, being embroiled in some kind of alleged uh, nude video scandals. We have also heard some mm, misuses of deep faking technology. This may be uh, your organizations with certain nefarious, certain malicious agendas, they misuse this technology. How does this challenge our traditional notions of identity and truth? So you have to use AR technology to detect what is actually deep fake. 
over, over there, whatever content you see. So technology has to be there. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for us to not believe what we see, right? As humans, Seeing is believing. Whatever we see, we want to believe. However, you know, this idea of a, a deep fakes, right? It really blurs the line with what is real and what is fake. And will lead us to kind of question everything. Right? And if we were to question everything that we see, how does that leave us feeling? I mean, how would you feel if you have to question everything you see? Yeah, I actually feel like I'm from this generation where I don't believe anything I see now because there's so much misinformation out there. You know the technology is out there. Even, you know, it's, it's user-generated content, so it doesn't require a large you know, conglomerate to, to produce these things. It's easily available on the internet. So, I don't know, I feel anxious all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm supposed to protect myself, but I also feel like I can't trust anyone. I can't trust what my family member tells me because maybe they saw something that was fake. I think this reminds me of... <laughs> movie series that I watched, I think Terminator, mm. right? Because Kevin mentioned that using AI to fight AI. Well, Terminator 1 to fight Terminator 2. <laughs> I, I still have my doubts about that. Well, I guess uh, something that comes to mind, right, is that uh, society needs to invest in education. Like, how do we spot a deep fake, right? Uh, what are some things that we need to look out for? And I guess the other thing I was thinking about is the ethics of it. That the people who are developing these technologies must do it with the ethics of doing good, right? Do no harm. And now we've come to a segment I'd like to call Guess the Deep Fake, where our panellists will give their best guesses on which person is digitally altered and which person is the real deal. Let's have a look. Okay, now let's have everyone's best guesses. Hanita? I think the red one is the real person because of the micro facial expressions. I think black is the deep fake. Well, for me, I'm team red. I think the left one is the real one because it looks more natural to me. But honestly, I'm quite freaked out. <laughs> I have no idea. Kevin? Yeah, to be honest, I really, really cannot tell. But okay, I just made a guess. The red is a deep fake. Mm. Ooh, so we've got two to one. We've got two people thinking that the real one is red mm -hmm. and Kevin, you think that the real one is wearing black. And the answer is red is the real one, black <laughs> is the deep fake. <laughs> yes, but how do you guys feel? Like, you know, looking at this deep fake technology up close and personal, does it make you feel uncomfortable? Kevin, you're no stranger to this. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's totally comfortable because anyway, I'm doing the uh, Avata business anyway. Uh, I'm very comfortable. I, actually, I, I myself is, uh, okay, I potentially will be one of the victims for sure because I, I cannot really see the much difference. Well, my colleague actually, probably like you guys, can most, uh, really kind of see the difference. Okay, uh, I'm the weak part of it. Yeah. And how did you guys tell that, you know, the red one was real and the black one was fake? It's just a wow guess. Wow guess? <laughs> just a wow guess. But sometimes you trust your instincts. Mm. You just can't tell. But some feature in that video, it just stands out a bit differently. So for me, because, okay, so first, I think the caveat here is that we are primed, right? That one is real and one is fake. So I was kind of looking between the mm. two, right? Like, what, what is the difference? And the difference I noticed was, like I said, microfacial expressions. Like when the person smiled, did the smile go to your eyes? Are you smiling with your eyes? Um, you know, or is the light when you move your mouth, how does that look like? Um, so that was what I was looking at. But this is if I'm primed. But if I were to just see the deep fake and see this individual in real life, I might just think it was that individual. So it's pretty scary, yeah. actually, that it's, it's so real and lifelike. And has this changed any of your perceptions of the technology? My view is we should live along the technology, okay? We cannot uh, stay away or we are afraid of this kind of technology. No, this is the way to go. So what, from personal point of view, from each individual point of view, we have to be responsibly use AR. So that's the thing, start from ourselves. We don't create a problem to the society, we contribute to society. Then use our individual behavior to influence the rest, even towards the nation, towards the international collaboration, then make this technology become the good part of the human. Uh, that's what I feel. 
From what we've discussed, right, there are many positives about AI technology. Right? It can be used for therapeutic purposes, it can be used for business, it can be used for advancement of technology, which is pretty exciting. But on the other hand, right now, how I've experienced it, and I think how Corey also has experienced it, right, is there are many victims, right? People who, whose likeness are being used without their consent, people whose likeness are used um, uh, in a very malicious way, right? So I think at this point, the deep fake or AI technology has a choice to make. Does it continue to be the villain, right? Or do you want to, you know, as moving towards the future, kind of be the hero? But I think regulation definitely is coming, okay? And not so much about AI regulating AI, but to regulate the humans behind the AI, behind the software, behind the programming. Regulation, I feel, has to be the way to go. But that will take time. We have come to the end of our chat and I think at the end of the day, we can all agree that mm. surrounding this technology, there are many different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I think Dr. Hanita put it very nicely, which is this technology is new and it has a choice to make. So thank you all. While the technology behind it can be used for good, there are many potential dangers as well. So we, as a society, need to stay careful and vigilant. If you'd like to find out more, you can check out Deepfakes, Algorithms and Society by Michael Filimowitz or How Algorithms Create and Prevent Fake News by Noah J.N. Syracuse. You can check out these books at your nearest library or on the NLB mobile app. And if you want to find out more about Deepfakes and other exciting issues, be sure to check out the Read to Be Sure website. And we want to know what you think. Are Deepfakes bad or can the technology behind it be used for good? Drop us a comment down below.